This is going to be my presentation on my thesis project at the University of Reading called Open Vehicle Diagnostics. I'm Ashkan Mursinia. Uh, Twitter, hand Twitter handle is randashm, if you're curious. So quick overview of what this project is going to be about. A uh, brief overview of my experience with car hacking, then what current solutions are available to end consumers for car diagnostics, some project goals for this uh, project, and a brief demo of Open Vehicle Diag's features, as well as some future plans for me continuing this project. I began getting into car hacking back in late 2019 with my Mercedes C-Class from 2006. Uh, began reverse engineering the ISOTP communication protocol between the radio and the instrument clusters so that I could get custom text to show up on the instrument clusters uh, music page. That then led to my W203 Canvas project where I had an Android app on my phone communicating with an Arduino hooked up to the CAN network of the car so that I could listen in for the steering wheel uh, seeking buttons to seek music on my phone and then also display the music playing from my phone on the instrument cluster display. That essentially evolved into my Android head unit project, which I have a whole YouTube series about. Uh, essentially modernizing this 2006 C-Class with a bunch of crazy features using an Android head unit and a bunch of custom code to uh, trace, uh, to modify signals over CAN bus. Why get into car hacking? This is a very quick thing. Um, car hacking is ex actually extremely fun. You can add features to older vehicles dating back to whenever you felt, uh, to whenever. And also it's my car, so why can't I add any features to it that I want? So I have a very quick demo here just going over the uh, head unit project that I have in my car. Apologies that there is no sound, so I will try narrating over this. So this is currently my head unit. I've currently got a bunch of powertrain measurements on this particular panel on here. Uh, some transmission measurements, which you'll see why that's important to me later, as well as gear selector showing me what gear I'm in. Uh, then I've also got a uh, AC overview where I can view uh, data coming from the climate display, as well as some uh, power fuel, e uh, fuel economy readings, which is something that the car could never do from stock. This is all being driven by this Arduino over here with two CAN shields attached to it, hooking into both CAN networks of my car. Right. So introduction into car diagnostics. Um, Back in March 2020, lockdown 1.0, I decided to try repairing my automatic transmission in my car. Uh, it was getting an issue whereby it would enter limp home mode, eventually entered limp home mode permanently, meaning that I could not shift out of second gear. I was able to fix the mechanical issue in this, and it now had a, the transmission computer in the car still had this error code stopping it from shifting out of second gear. So I contacted my local Mercedes dealer and asked them for a quote for them to plug their diagnostic tool in and clear the code. They quoted 200 pounds, which I very politely declined. Um, main issue with this is that you currently have some very cheap software on say, for instance, Android, there's an app called Talk, which communicates with a generic scan tool. These scan tools cannot access the CAN bus network or other ECUs on the network. They can only do OBD, which is a read-only protocol with the engines own ECU. The solution to this was to use an Arduino, which you can see over here on the right, with a horrible CAN connection to it, which allowed me to write custom CAN packets to send uh, KWP protocol packets, which is a diagnostic protocol, to the transmission control module to clear the errors on it. So it doesn't, it is a, so generally speaking, the Diagnostic application in a car communicates with, with, with the vehicle itself in a fairly standard way. You have a diagnostic application sat on your computer, which in turn speaks to an adapter driver, which sometimes is embedded in the application itself if it's a proprietary adapter they're using, which then talks to your diagnostic adapter, which plugs into the OBD port of the car. This is kind of like a breakout, if you will, whereby it's connected to all the various interface networks within the car, as well as the car battery for a constant source of power. Those networks then go to all the ECUs in your car. What's common? Well, there are various standard transport protocols such as CAN, ISOTP, which was touched upon in the last presentation, Keyword Protocol 2000 and ISO 9141-2. 
Uh, there's various diagnostic protocols for doing diagnostic procedures with the ECU. So there's OBD, which is a legal requirement on all vehicles since 2000, I believe, in Europe. Uh, Keyword Protocol 2000, which is now being superseded by UDS or U Unified Diagnostic Services. There's also some adapter protocols for allowing an application to talk to an adapter. So there's pass-through or SAE J2, uh, J2534. There's the newer DPDU API, which I believe is by Vector. And there's also any miscellaneous proprietary protocols for, it, uh, for various adapters. Quick touch up on Keyword Protocol 2000 versus UDS. Uh, they both use the same message format regardless of the transport layer. So uh, they can either use K-Line or ISOTP to talk to the ECUs. Um, they both use the same package structure. So you'd have a service ID defining what request message you want followed by a local ID and then any optional data at the end of the message that you want to send to the ECU. Uh, if the ECU responds back with a positive message, which is a confirm confirmation of the request, it will respond back with your service ID plus a constant uh, 0x40 with all the response from the ECU. And if it's a negative response, it responds with the first byte being uh, 0x7f followed by the service identifier, then the error code. I should note now that the error codes, service IDs, and local IDs differ, differ slightly between KWP2000 and UDS. So this raises a question then, if there are so, so many standard ways of talking to a vehicle, why are there so many different tools that OEMs ship? Each OEM seems to have their own tool set. In the case of Mercedes, they even have three various tools to diagnose their vehicles. They've got uh, Zentry Diagnostics, uh, Diagnostic Assist Service, and Vidimo, as well as DTS Monaco, which is a slightly different one. Uh, there's also all of these various adapters. You've got X-Horse, Tactrix OpenPort, Bosch VCI, and SD Connect, which is Mercedes' own proprietary one. And you also have handheld scan tools like iCarSoft, which are designed to work with various uh, multiple vehicles. However, these are all extremely expensive software, uh, ex expensive hardware, and the software tends to be only licensed to workshops, and you can never really get it as an individual. So what does this lead to? This eventually ends up leading to piracy, whereby commercial software ends up on eBay at a fairly, what seems to be a decent price, and you get all these clone adapters, which are essentially cheap Chinese-made adapters using like a very, very basic CPU. Uh, my advice to anyone listening to this is do not go down this route. There, all of these adapters and uh, software tends to be loaded with malware on it. So at the end of the day, the consumer loses because they tend to get a laptop filled with malware and the OEM loses because someone's pirating their software. Not a great situation. So this leads me nicely into the actual project that I've set out to do. So first of all, Open Vehicle Diag, as the project is called, this is going to be targeted at enthusiasts and individuals only. It's not designed for commercial or workshop use. My idea for this is to create a cross-platform uh, ECU diagnostic tool, which also has cross OEM support. So you could hopefully use it with multiple OEMs uh, rather than having a variant of it for every single one. Um, an easy un to understand JSON format to replace proprietary diagnostic data. I'll touch up on this on the next slide, um, which basically dictates how the ECU should respond back to a mess with a message and how you interpret that data and present it to the user. Diagnostic protocols, are, uh, the project plans to support all three major ones, so keyword protocol, UDS, and OBD. For now, we're only targeting ISO TP and CAN transport layers, and also for now, we're only going to be supporting the J25. J2534 protocol. Uh, things which won't be in this project will be ECU feature coding, which is essentially uh, unlocking features on your vehicle's ECUs, and no software flashing support, partly due to liability reasons. Next on the list was to create an open source, an open source uh, adapter based on the uh, SAE J2534 Parsifal protocol. Um, I've utilized Machina's uh, existing M2 adapter for this, and I've also unofficially ported the API to Linux and OS X, since officially this API only supports Windows 32-bit. Uh, so next we touch up on the proprietary data format passing. So 
CBF files, which is an old data format that Daimler uses for their own vehicles uh, to store various functions, diagnostic routines, and ECU data. This has been superseded by their SMRD uh, standard, and they are both derived from the ODXD uh, file format. So my parser that I've written is based on a guy called uh, JG Lim's work. Uh, he has written a open source tool to work with these CBF files called Caesar Suite. Um, and I've essentially taken some of the code that he's written and made it so that it prints out these uh, or passes these CBF files into a JSON format, which I have defined. And I will only be extracting, so these CBF files contain a ton of data, including stuff like variant uh, coding, which is basically feature coding, uh, memory regions for ECU flashing. But for this, I'm only targeting ECU variants, which are basically software IDs. So an ECU could have like six different software uh, variants on it, and you need to know which one it is because an error code might mean something on different variant IDs. Uh, diagnostic routine functions and error code descriptions, since that's pretty handy for diagnostics and also the ability to translate the strings from the CBF files into any language because the source tends to be German. So implementation. Quick overview of this. Um, for the entire application and the majority of the parsing work, I used Rust for this, with C++ only being used to, for the M2 adapters firmware. Keeping the code modular, so every component will live under its own crate. A crate is basically another way of saying a package in Rust terms. Um, this means that you can essentially take my diagnostic servers that I've written for keyword protocol and UDS and port them to your own application. You could take the adapter API create that I've written and for say, for instance, pass through and port that to your own project if you want to. And also keep the interface clean and simple for the end user since the end user I'm expecting will know some things about card diagnostics but won't be an absolute professional when it comes to using it. So why Rust? Quickly want to touch up on this. Uh, Native performance, simple build system with cargo, uh, memory safety without any form of garbage collection, uh, easy cross compiling for various architectures and uh, operating systems, zero cost, ex zero cost abstraction, uh, abstraction, meaning that I can write as high level code as I want and it will all get compiled into the fastest it can. And also partly because there's the Surday serialization and deserialization library, which is absolutely awesome at converting Rust's data structure struts into JSON and vice versa. Uh, cons of Rust, unfortunately, are that there is a, currently a lack of mature GUI libraries for writing any interfaces with, and there is a steep learning curve involved with learning the language if you've come from an object-orientated background of programming. So reg in regards to GUIs, I've, uh, GUIs, I've ended up using a library called Iced. Uh, this has multi-platform support for Linux, OS X, Windows, and WebAssembly, uh, which is another target that Rust can compile to, meaning in theory, you could port this application to the web. Um, responsive layouts, custom widgets, async actions, all the bells and whistles. However, it is still experimental. So the API is changing constantly, and that's something that I need to bear in mind with this. Quickly touching up on the adapter. Uh, side of things of how I've managed to port it over to Linux, but that's not the main focus of this presentation. Um, there is a cross-platform serial crate called Serial Port RS, which allows you to enumerate serial ports, uh, no matter the operating system you're using, all with common interfaces. Um, I've decided that Linux and OS X will build 64-bit libraries, even though the pass-through API stipulates that the library must be 32-bit on Windows, but that's old really old now, so I'm not supporting that on the new platforms. And you put all of your data regarding to your built library into your home folder and dot pass through. With the API on Windows, there is a registry key that you must merge into the registry, which basically tells any program utilizing this API where to find the function library for it and the capabilities and COM port of the adapter. That I've all decided to move into a JSON file, which you can see on the right, and put it in that um, pass-through folder. Quickly want to touch up on the JSON format, which I have for Open Vehicle Diag. So first of all, what to quick recap to what to include, ECU variant IDs. So again, an e ECU can have like multiple ECU variant IDs and each one stipulates a certain software version running on that ECU, which can dictate the functions which it can run as well as the error codes uh, and error code descriptions. Um, also being 
included is error codes and understandable descriptions for each error. So like, for instance, what does what does some error code mean? Uh, diagnostic routines that you can query the ECU, that's something that's going to be included. And also presentation data, which is how to present the ECU's response to the end user. Uh, below on the center of the screen is an example of the metadata section within the JSON format. So it basically states the name of the ECU, a description of it. And then starting is a list of variants. Each variant will have a name and a description of that variant, uh, as well as a list of patterns, which is the uh, variant IDs to match to, as well as a list of errors and services. I should mention now that all of the OVD JSON that you're going to see has come from a CRD ECU CBF file from Daimler. So CRD is a common rail diesel injection ECU for uh, their 2006 E-Class. Um, Example, so here's an example of some error codes that you would see on this ECU. So for instance, here we have 201A and the description is boost pressure sensor non-electrical. Very, very descriptive errors, which would be helpful if you do have a check engine light. Uh, quickly want to pop up on how I'm present, uh, talk about how I'm presenting stuff. So each payload that you send to the ECU has a description and a payload, which is a hex, hex string that you send. Um, each payload will then have an optional output parameter section, which basically states what's in the response message and how is that going to be presented to the user. So in this case, there is a uh, there is a parameter called AC. Uh, there's no units attached to it because it's not a number. It's one bit long starting at bit 102 within the response message. And the data format is a Boolean. Now, also to note with Booleans is that you can optionally override the positive and or true and false uh, matches since sometimes true doesn't necessarily mean explicitly true. In this case, it, it says air conditioning is installed and false would indicate no air conditioning is installed. Uh, there's also uh, quickly want to touch up on enums. So this is something that we found within the CBF file and also ODX specification, which is that sometimes a value can be mapped to a word or a definition. So in this case, we've got a eight bit, uh, a one byte, uh, value and that's mapped to a table whereby which dictates the uh, emissions uh, regulation that the ECU matches. So currently now I want to touch up on the main focus of this project which was the application itself. So keeping it clean and simple the home page was just very very simple to write basically shows some uh, information about what the adapter supports or whatever API you're using, has a few functions written to it. And also I should note that the entire UI has a dark mode because that seems to be all the trend nowadays. For that dark mode, if you're diagnosing your car at night, it's good for your eyes. Uh, very simply, there's a very basic CAN tracer built into OVD at this point in time, updates 25 times per second, changing bytes are viewed in red, and there's an optional binary view if you want to locate individual bits in the message which are changing from update to update. ECU scanner is one big bit of this project. So essentially, this is a diagnostic mode that OVD has. You've got two modes. One is where it will scan the car for ISO TP endpoints and then query each individual endpoint in the car if it has, uh, if it supports KWP or UDS. And then there's the manual mode for when you have completed the scan and if you have any data uh, or the OVD JSON, you can load that up and start a diagnostic session properly. Automated scanner. So how are we doing this? Well, first of all, I need to assume that OVD has no idea about what the car is when it's scanning it. Uh, first of all, uh, scanning for ECUs in the car, which utilize the ICTB transport protocol, uh, scan the entire CAN ID range from zero to seven FF, which is the maximum you can do with 11, with a standard 11 byte ID on CAN network. Uh, scan slowly to avoid overloading the CAN network. So I'm requesting one, uh, well, I'm sending one frame every 100 milliseconds. And essentially this entire scan process is built, uh, is inspired by a lot of the work that uh, SCAPI already has, where it essentially tries sending an ISO TP start frame to the car and the ECU should respond back with a flow control, regardless if I'm sending the data or not to it. Uh, you can capture that flow control message to get the endpoint ID. Uh, then we try starting a KW uh, keyword protocol 2000 session with the endpoint and try asking the ECU to enter an extended diagnostic session, which is the payload uh, uh, OX10OX92. And then once we've completed that, we'll try the same thing with a UDS session, which is a slightly different uh, local identifier of 0, uh, 0x03, 
this actually means that if that we can tell which protocol the ECU supports because the local IDs are different for each protocol to enter the same mode. Um, and there's also no overlap between the two protocols. And then also then save that JSON or save that scan result to JSON for later use. So we can avoid scanning the car again and again if the user wants to uh, interrogate one of their ECUs later. So automated scanner, uh, want to quickly touch up on the intro screen that the user will see. So first of all, note that the uh, scan will automatically terminate if the battery voltage of the car falls below 11.7 volts, which I've deemed as a safe cutoff point. This is partly due to the fact this scan does take a few minutes. Um, I've told the user to make sure that their, their engine is off, and this is partly because uh, putting the ECUs in extended diagnostic mode will cause all sorts, of, might cause certain undefined behavior. I don't know that, so I'm just being safe. And then also telling the user that uh, if there are any warnings on the dashboard, don't panic. It's fine. Everything will return to normal as soon as the scan is complete. So to begin with, OVD begins listening for existing CAN traffic, so we don't accidentally send CAN frames with those same CAN IDs, which, called, which could cause really undefined behavior on the car. Uh, then we begin scanning for ISO TP endpoints. This is some, the work that SCAPI has done. Once it's found those endpoints, it then does the testing of KWP2000 and UDS. And then we can save it to JSON. So if the ECU supports UDS, so here you can see uh, part of the JSON file for two cars. So first one on the on the left is a Mercedes B class that we have. Uh, the name of the e so for each ECU the name is defaulted to unknown ECU name. This is partly just because I haven't implemented a way for it to read the part number of the ECU yet. On keyword protocol two thousand, however, if you see on the right, by default the name of the ECU is actually the part number, and this is really useful because you can then go to Google and search up that part number, and it will tell you what ECU that is and then you can go ahead and put that in there instead. Um, quickly want to touch up on some scan results that we had. So for the W246 2018 Mercedes B class, I found 29 ISO TP compatible ECUs of which 23 support UDS and zero support keyword protocol 2000. As you can see by this image here, uh, the car was very unhappy during the scan and this is why I told the user not to panic at the start screen. Uh, this all goes away after a few seconds when the ECUs return back to their normal state. A uh, couple of other cars, so my own uh, Mercedes W203, which is a 2006 C-Class, I found 14 ISO TP compatible ECUs. None of them supports UDS, which is expected because of its age, and 13 support keyword protocol 2000. Uh, Lexus NX300H, uh, I only found two ISO TP compatible ECUs, of which both of them support UDS. Don't quite know why I found so few. Uh, now touching up on the diagnostic session. So once the user has uh, saved their scan results, they can then open the save file up. This is the save file for my own car, which I already know all of the ECs in the car. Uh, once you load that save file, OVD will automatically then tell you which sessions you can support, you can launch. So for instance, here the UDS button is grayed out because none of the ECs in my car support UDS. You can launch a Keyword Protocol 2000 session where you can just enter in uh, you can select a keyword protocol 2000 command and its local identifier and give it some arguments, send it, and the ECU will respond back as passed and the error codes will be displayed in a meaningful way to the user. You can launch a custom session, which is essentially just an ISO TP generic session. You can just send payloads and listen in for its response. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, or you could load the JSON session, which is where you load that uh, OVD JSON that I talked about earlier. Now, when you load the JSON session with a supported JSON file, you can see at the top of the screen here that OVD has automatically detected the ECU variant uh, in the car. So in this case, it's the common rail diesel by Delphi. Uh, Diag version, which is the software version on it, as well as the vendor, which is Delphi in this case. Um, now, here is the basic UI on it. Again, I stress that this is all very early stuff. Um, so you've got a button to read any error codes on the ECU or clear them. Uh, you've got you can you've got a search bar where you can search for any functions which have been found in that JSON. You can select a function and read it. So if you look on the right of the screen, you can see that on this ECU that I have on my desk, it has found 20 error codes because it's not plugged into an engine. Very unhappy ECU here. Um, and each error code here has a very very good description as to 
what this error actually means. If you were to try scanning these error codes with a generic scan tool, because some of these error codes will show up, these generic scan tools might not actually know what these error codes mean, and it will just show you the number. Um, then you can also see further down, I have been querying the ECU for uh, certain functions. In this case, you can see how the response is passed. So for instance, here I request DTO on ABC, and the response is ABC, no active body control installed. As well as boost pressure, uh, the response is boost pressure one bar. That is a passed number. And the unit is appended on the end, which is correct. Um, now, this is a quick video showing a very early preview of something that I did a while back, where essentially using the transmission in my car, which is EGS 52, which is the uh, 722.6 gearbox by Mercedes, um, I'm able to monitor the current readings of the uh, modulating pressure solenoid, which basically ensures that all shifts are nice and smooth. So as you can see here, as I move the shift selector, you can see that number uh, fluctuating. All right. So yeah, you can see that uh, fluctuating. And this is stuff which you would never be able to do with a generic scan tool. And also, I'd like to point out that this is actually quite useful for diagnosing a faulty solenoid in this transmission, because its current value would go through the roof or just be zero. Um, now, this is a bit of fun I had with some diagnostics. So on the instrument cluster I have on my desk, there is a function where you can draw lines on the screen in a diagnostic routine. I've abused that completely by writing a very simple piece of code, which loads an image um, from disk, and then figures out where all the lighter pixels are, and then attempts to draw that image on the LCD display of the car. I would like to stress that this takes about 10 minutes per image, so it's not exactly practical for a car. And also, the instrument cluster is disabled when it's in, in a diagnostic session. Um, but as you can see from the right, the code for most of this is actually just to draw the image itself. Uh, the actual uh, code to, di to start to open the adapter, then to open a Keyword Protocol 2000 session is actually very, very simple. It's just these few lines up here. And that's part of the modularity I had within the code, is that everything's meant to be nice and simple for someone to add to their own project. So briefly touching up on some future plans for the project. Uh, the main app itself has loads of potential things that we can add to it over time. So for instance, adding support for SocketCAN uh, for Linux and the DPDU adapter API, uh, additional transport protocol supports, that would be, uh, that would be, oh, that would be K-line based ones, J1850, serial communication interface, DO, uh, diagnostic over IP, et cetera. Um, support for extended and mixed addressing scanning for ISO TP. Uh, optional integration with other tools such as Scappy and Savvy Can. So this means that some of my code is offloaded onto those tools, which are already really well defined. Um, writing adjustments to ECU user input. I should note that this is not the same as variant coding. This is basically just a tweaking a parameter, for instance, your idle speed of your engine, if you so needed to do so. Uh, graphing of real-time values. So currently, real-time values are just displayed as a looping text or an updating text box. Uh, I'd like to actually have the ability to graph that over time. Um, also, adding COM parameters to OVD's JSON specification. This would essentially mean that you can just load the JSON file, and OV, uh, OVD itself will then establish the correct communication method with the ECU rather than relying on the scan results I had. Um, Next is also joining the procedures or diagnostic routines together into a meaningful test sequence. A good example of this is the compression test on Mercedes ECUs, whereby from looking at the JSON that I've passed, there are like 12 different sequences you have to send to the ECU. And you also have to constantly request a certain one to get the current compression results constantly as the engine is cranking. And then once it's done, you then have to tell the ECU to go back into to stop the compression test and go back to normal mode. Um, and also ex possibly extending the automated scan to automatically scan for error codes in your vehicle. So looping through all the ECUs that it's found in the vehicle, trying to scan for error codes and um, whatever else you so fancy. Uh, lastly, uh, to uh, future plans for the Machina side of things, I plan to support eventually their A0 hardware, which is ESP32 based or ESP32 uh, system on a chip, which is a lot cheaper than their current M2 solutions. This should make it more affordable for the end user. Um, K-Line and J J1850 implementation for the M2. This is part of the J2534 protocol. 
Um, so I do plan on adding support for that for the M2, so it becomes a nearly fully complete uh, J J2534 adapter. Also, as a possible hypothetical question, it might be possible eventually to port the entirety of Open Vehicle Diag to a single ESP32 using its onboard HTTP server, which it which you can load on it, meaning that a user could just connect via Wi-Fi to the dongle plugged into their car, and with anything like a phone or a laptop, just connect via a web browser to it and do all of this for a web browser. Quickly uh, to summarize before I finish this, so. Car diagnostics doesn't have to necessarily be reliant on professional software. It can actually end up being affordable. In fact, once I add support for socket can, it should theoretically be possible for someone to simply buy a $5 can shield and uh, a Raspberry Pi and do all of this since Rust does compile to the ARM architecture. Uh, Diagnostic adapters can be created from open source hardware, which again is, uh, drastically reduces the cost of the uh, of the adapters. Uh, some of these Bosch VCI ones go on sale for about three hundred and twenty pounds, as a good example of that. And it is indeed possible to port diagnostic adapter and um, diagnostic uh, diagnostic. Um, uh, and adapter APIs to other operating systems, meaning that this isn't all necessarily restricted to Windows. Um, and also, a vehicle can be scanned without prior knowledge of the vi of the uh, or data about the vehicle itself. So a good example of this is all of the um, current professional software tends to have a huge database of all of the ECUs in each vehicle, whereas Open Vehicle Diag can essentially build this up from scratch without any knowledge of what's in the vehicle. You can load this on any vehicle and scan it. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much for for watching. Julian, can I hand control back to you? Yeah, we all have indeed some questions. So a question by Mario De Felice. He asked, did you manage to reconfigure an ECU or change at any features? Um, reconfigure an ECU? Do you mean as in like variant coding it? So changing a, com a complete feature set on that? If in that case, no, because that's not part of the project. Right. And do you plan to look into it was his second question. Uh, maybe eventually. But from what I've seen from uh, uh, from Caesar Suite itself, the process of modifying features in ECU is extremely cumbersome because there is security protocols you have to uh, you have to go through first, such as seed key authentication with the ECU. OK, our next question from Daniel Broomhead is, what is the lifespan of this sort of project? As your car is quite old, how long can you see this being relevant? Or does it scale with the technology in the future? That is a very good question, Daniel. So as you saw from one of the images that I said, uh, that I shown, this can be run on modern cars. So for instance, the 2018 B class I had. Um, I have tried it in other cars as well from modern ones, and there are very varying results. But this is mainly designed as a stopgap solution for consumers with older I'd say vehicles, whereby the OEM is essentially charging you more money than the car is worth to try fixing it because it's a software issue. So I do definitely think this has a long um, lifespan as long as OEMs start dropping support for their vehicles over time and consumers still want to use them. <laughs>